Thank you. Um, right, everybody, uh, that makes my clock is set at 7.30, so I'm going to start um, start this talk now. Um, and just briefly, I want to say, I'm my name is Laura, and I am the research assistant at the Devil's Porridge Museum. And it's so lovely to see you all here tonight um, and to hear about this fascinating woman. Um, so I want to let you know that um, this meeting has been recorded. So if you don't want your um, faces shown, feel free to turn your camera off. That's absolutely fine. And we'll only record, we're only gonna um, post the recording of Melanie's talk. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to um, pop them in the chat. <laughs> What I'm going to do also is just to sort of mitigate any background noise, mute everybody apart from Melanie whilst um, she's talking. Um, so I will hand over to Melanie now for her fabulous talk on this fascinating woman. Right. First thing I'll do is I'll share the screen. So. OK, and then we start. OK, can can everybody see that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to tell you about this extraordinary woman, um, uh, a woman who's now forgotten from our collective memory, and yet whose name between uh, 1920 and 1925 was splashed all over the world's press, making her a cause celeb. Now, I never know where to start with, with Stan. I mean, she's a very striking um, woman because you can talk extensively about different periods of her life. She fitted more exciting and eventful things in, into her life than the average male did at that time, let alone for a woman who was born in 1884. However, I'm going to begin her story on the 27th of June, 1920. Stan was 36 years old. Now, 1920 it was only three years after the Russian Revolution. The country was closed to foreigners. Only a few hand-picked journalists and soci with socialist leanings were given entry visas to Russia at this time. Now, Stan had journalistic credentials. She had reported on the Spartacist uprising in Germany in 1919. And then she'd reported on the cat putsch for the Daily News in March 1920. She was commissioned by the New York World and clutching an invitation from Grigory Chitterin, who was the first People's Commissioner in um, Foreign Affairs in the Soviet government, Stan arrives in Moscow. Now, despite Despite her official invitation, within hours of arriving in Moscow, she is arrested as a British spy. She's imprisoned in Moscow's notorious Lubyanka prison, and she's condemned to death. Now, that in itself is really interesting. But what then followed, Stan successfully sued Bolshevik Russia for false imprisonment as a spy and she received £3,000. Now, there are only two Brits that that happened to, and she was one of them. The other one was a genuine spy, and uh, he was actually murdered by um, the Soviets at that time. So she received this money. She then went on, now wait for this, to unsuccessfully sue the United States of America for hiring the spy who made the false allegation. And that false allegation resulted in her imprisonment and being condemned to death. Now, she was actually backed by 100 cross-party MPs in the British Parliament. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, wow. When I discovered that all of this, my first feeling was, well, who, who is this woman? How on earth did she manage to get a visa into Russia at that time? Was she really a British spy? Why did she call herself by a man's name, Stan? And how come she's not a well-known historical figure? When I started to research Stan's personal life, I hit a complete brick wall. Apart from a few lines about her fight for justice, I found in the newspapers and the parliamentary records, 
there was absolutely nothing about her. So to piece together Stan's life, I had to visit archives in Florence, Canada, New York, Dartington Hall in Somerset, the British Library, the Parliamentary Archives, the National Archives in Kew, and Nuffield College, Oxford University. And I also had to read loads and loads of memoirs of people I knew as I pieced things together that she'd come across. And so I would get her name here, her name there. It was a, a, a very, very long, long job. So who was Stan Harding? Well, let's backtrack a little bit. Constant Grace Harding was born on the 12th of July, 1884 in Toronto in Canada. Her father was Edwin John Harding and he was an Englishman from London. He was the son of a tailor's trimming assistant. He took the ship over to make his fortune. Now her mother, this lovely lady here, um, Grace Leslie, her name was, she was 37 years old when she, she married. She was four years younger than Edwin when they got married. Um, uh, sorry, Edwin was four years younger than her. Grace was from a prominent, wealthy family who had emigrated in 1820 to Upper Canada from Scotland. The Leslie family, um, they owned dry goods stores and they were so successful, they even minted their own currency. Um, I've actually found in research that wasn't as unusual as we think it is, but anyway, they had their own currency that was used um, at that time. Now she has one sibling, um, Stan had an older brother who was born a year ahead of her. Stan's parents were strict Plymouth Brethren, and this is very important for her personality. Edwin had been converted by the founder of the Close Brethren, John Nelson Darby. So that was quite something. Um, and many members of the family were converted as well. And they apparently spoke in biblical English. These thou's and giveth. Now, despite the wealth they enjoyed, her father thought the secular world was evil. I can't quite get my head around the balance of that because he traveled a lot. But anyway, according to her memoir, this is, this is what she said. Now at the age of 13, um, Stan started to question if God existed. And she asked her brother who also had doubts at the time. And when Edwin, the father, found out, Stan was severely punished and she was taken out of the Plymouth Brethren Little Community School so not to contaminate the other children. And she was banished to her room. And she says, after days of isolation, she begged her father to forgive her. And for seven days, he told her she had to continuously write 100 times a day, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now, I'm actually bringing that in because I'm trying to give you an impression of her personality and how it was structured right from the beginning. Now, there was family money, obviously, from um, the wealth of Grace's mother, and that enabled the Hardings to travel and live in Europe, in hotels, in apartments, and in Plymouth Brethren communities. At one point, they ended up in a Plymouth Brethren com community near Bristol, um, Clevedon, if anyone knows, lovely little place. Um, when they traveled around Europe, she became fluent in French, German, and Italian. Now her education, she was educated basically by private tutors or in very, very small Plymouth Brethren um, schools. Harold went to private schools. So I hope you've got a little bit of an impression of what her background was. Now, there weren't many options for women of her station. It was either marriage, family, or children, and or children. Stan did not want to be controlled by a man like her father. She mentions her father being a very domineering person quite a lot. 
So she began to save little bits of money, pocket money, when she could. When the family went on their travels again in 1904 and reached Florence, Stan ran away. She was 19 and had secretly rented a room on the Piazza Donatello and changed her name to Stan. Now that actually sounds quite unbelievable, but it was quite easy to do. There were two English language newspapers which advertised rooms and hotel rooms, advertised jobs, advertised maids. So I'm absolutely sure she would have picked up that information when they were there. There was quite a large community, expat community in Florence at that time, uh, English speaking, German speaking, but the biggest group were the English speakers. Now, what she said was she felt like a songbird released from a cage. That's how she described her newfound freedom. Now, she begged her brother, who was studying for exams in London, to join her, but he said no because he passed the consular exams and was heading off for the diplomatic service in China. So from 1904 to the 27th of June, 1920, this remarkable woman led an exciting, full and bohemian life. Now in Florence, she had no money to back her, um, which I found was a common theme in her adult life. But she earned her own living, she taught languages, and she copied paintings. Uh, she says herself the paintings weren't very good, but she earned money by doing that. Now, through her teaching, she met her husband. He was a German doctor, and they married in 1906. But they had the most weird and bizarre marriage because they lived separately. Um, she had an apartment, he had an apartment, where he had his um, med medical practice. They would meet for supper. Um, it was just a very, very strange relationship. He was also quite a lot older than her. Now her exciting life, she became friends with notable expats, such as the American Mabel Dodge, the actress Eleonora Deuce, uh, the pianist Arthur Rupenstein, the American siblings Gertrude Stein, and her brother Leo, Gertrude's lover, Alex, Alice B. Toklas, and the art historian, Bernard Berenson. There was a lot of amazing people before the First World War, all wandering around um, Florence. There was a freedom there that you often couldn't have back in London, back in Paris, or even New York at that time. Now, Stan had lovers of both sexes. Um, they were expats who were either living in or visiting Florence, including the German artist Kathy Kolwitz, or Kate Kolwitz, who in 1907 spent a year in Florence. Also, one of Stan's lovers was John Reed, the journalist, the firebrand who went on to write 10 Days That Shook the World after witnessing the Russian Revolution in 1917. And she also, one of her lovers, was the English artist and avant-garde theatre director, Ed Edward Gordon Craig. So she's mixing with these incredibly artistic people, plus a lot of politicals. Um, and it must have been an amazing experience for someone who'd been brought up so strictly. But the love of her life was not a very good artist called Stephen Hoisey. He was a married man who was married to a female artist and he met um, Stan through Mabel Dodge. Mabel Dodge actually did not like him at all. Uh, she called him a black lizard at one point. Anyway, they all mixed, they all floated around the various houses and the villas that they were. Now, in fact, it was the breakup of this affair because he refused to separate from his wife, even though his wife was separated from him and she was having an affair. Um, but it was a breakup of this affair and possibly an abortion that sent her off traveling to China between 1911 and 1913. 
Now, I'm not going to go into her um, abortion, but I mean, if you if you really get interested in Stan um, after my talk, then please do um, please do purchase or borrow my book because it will give you the details of that. But there were some amazing poems that, that I read written by Hoisey, and he actually talks in a very veiled way of the child that we lost um, and, it, and it alludes to an abortion. Anyway, so off she goes to China to visit her brother who was now a British consul over there. And this is where Stan witnessed her first brutal war as China was in the throes of a civil war. Now this woman, Stan, has been brought up in a strict Plymouth Brethren home she runs away, sets up home in Florence. She becomes a bohemian artist, marries, has affairs, and then takes her, herself off alone and travels to China and India in 1911. I mean, it, it is pretty amazing. She had no money either, so she would have been doing it all on a shoestring. Now, there's not enough time to tell you about her ventures in the East, but they are pretty amazing. Um, and especially on her way back, um, when she stops for three months in India, and that's where she falls in love with temple dancing, um, and which ended up being banned in India because they're, um, it, way back, the temple girls were thought to be prostitutes. However, the dancing was absolutely beautiful. And if you're interested, have a look on YouTube to see the, the absolute exquisite moves of it. Anyway, she got fascinated and always in the back of her mind when she went back to Europe was, I somehow, I'm getting back to India. So she heads back. She arrives in Italy in late 1913 via India, but her plans of returning to India were scuppered because on the 4th of August, 1914, the UK declares war on Germany. Now, Italy at this time was a member of the Triple Alliance and immediately declared neutrality. But in May 1915, they declared war on the Austrian-Hungarian -Hungary Empire and then on Germany. So the expats started fleeing Florence, but Stan did not leave. She was, however, in a difficult situation because she was married to a German national. And as a woman, at that time, she had to renounce her own nationality, her British nationality, on marriage. And we, before we started the talk, we were actually having a little discussion about that. Um, now, Stan was not interested in the war at all at this time. She just wanted to get back to India. But to do so, she needed to get a divorce and get her British passport back. Now, as soon as the war started, her husband, Karl, went back to Germany and he became um, a medic in the German army. Um, you know, th they were always on sort of good terms and talking. I'm not even sure that the marriage was consummated, um, but it was very handy for Stan to have a husband at that time. And it was probably quite handy for him to have a wife. But now the war had started, it was very, very complicated. Now there are many adjectives that I think that I would describe Stan. Independent, daring, foolhardy, brave, but stubborn, unrealistic and naive was something that I think comes up a lot. She was advised by um, official and non-official sources in both Rome and Bern not to go to Berlin to secure her divorce. She could go to Germany, no problem. She was a German national. But once in Germany, she would not be able to leave and she would be probably be imprisoned as a spy. Now, in 1918, early 19, uh, the, the summer of 1918, Germany was really starting to lose the war and food and resources were in short supply. So Stan, of course, being Stan, ignored all of the advice that she was given 
and she arrives in Berlin in September 1918. So just before the armistice, um, she went immediately to seek out her friend Kathy Kolwitz, who is a well-known socialist and had lots of connections. Now, after the Kaiser abdicated on the 9th of November 1918, a new republic was declared and the armistice was negotiated. Germany was temporarily ruled by a coalition. But revolution was never far from the service, surface, and this is what Stan had jumped into. People were deeply unhappy. And by the end of 1918, Berlin was falling deeper and deeper into chaos. I mean, the negotiations were going on. Um, it was politically unstable, especially in Berlin. Troops were returning to Berlin. And the unemployed and the unemployment um, levels were very high. 5,000 Berliners had died of the flu that month alone, because remember, we've got the flu pandemic um, that's starting to, to take over. There were strikes. There were severe food shortages due to the Allied blockades. And whilst the interim government were squabbling amongst themselves on what was the best deal that they could get from the Allies, allies, all this is going on. And when I sort of look at that period, I always think of this painting, The Carnival by Max Beckman. And he painted this in 1918. And to me, it sums up the chaos of Germany during this period, because a carnival traditionally is a celebration. But this was Beckman's pessimistic vision of Germany's political chaos um, at the time. And Beckman himself had had a breakdown and was suffering at one point from shell shock. Now, arriving in Berlin during this period was undoubtedly the beginning of Stan's downfall. But for Stan, this was exciting. You know, she was living on adrenaline and she'd never felt so alive. Stan was always short of money. I keep saying that she was. <laughs> she was always looking for ways of how to make a bit of money to live. But somehow she seemed to survive and began providing foreign correspondents with copy. At this stage, she, she wasn't writing copy herself and she didn't have a byline, but she was providing information. Because of her access um, and her fluency in Germany, and because she knew um, lots of people through Katy Kolwitz, um, socialists, communists, all sorts of people, she was getting in to political meetings so she could report and she could give information quite easily. Now, the meeting of her nemesis, Marguerite Harrison, in 1919 now is just about to arrive. It was early January 1919, and this American journalist working for the Baltimore Sun Mrs. Marguerite Harrison arrives in Berlin. And this was just as the Spartacist uprising between the communists and the moderates begin their pitch battles in the streets. Now, you might think, okay, another journalist, a female journalist turning up. Wow, is that unusual? Well, actually, no. Female correspondents in 1919 weren't that unusual. I mean, they weren't as uh, popular as they are today, but they weren't that unusual. Um, Peggy Hull, Cora May Harris, Francis Marion, to name but a few correspondents, uh, reported on the Great War and had their own bylines. And Louise Bryant, who Jack Reed's wife, she reported on the Russian Revolution because she was with him there. So he wrote his book and she was writing reports back for newspapers. However, there were no female journalists in Berlin at this time because of the difficulty of getting into Germany. Now, Marguerite, another very striking woman, American, was 41 years old and she was a widow. She grew up in a wealthy Baltimore family. Her father was a shipping merchant. So like Stan, she had traveled a lot as a child she also was multilingual and she spoke German and French fluently. And because of her family connections, um, 
she had previously met many people in the upper echelons of European society. Um, she was introduced to many of the British royal family, as well as other royal families around Europe. Um, so she also had contacts. And if you read any of her memoirs of when she was in Berlin, you will see her mixing with all sorts of people as well. Now, when Marguerite discovered there was another female foreigner in Berlin who spoke English, she sought her out. And on meeting Stan the first time, she described her as a frail looking woman with delicate features, close, her hair close clipped like a man's and the most engaging smile. And they immediately hit it off and they became friends. They even shared a hotel room together. I don't think there was necessarily any lesbian connections in that. There might have been, there might not have been. I think it was because there were two females alone in war-torn Berlin. However, what Stan did not know was that Marguerite Harrison was also working for US military intelligence. She had the rank of captain, she had a cipher named B, and a government salary of $750 a month. And her mission was to report back on the mood of Germans. Were they likely to accept Wilson's 14 points? How strong were the communists? Are they likely to take over? Are we going to get another Russia? Now, Stan would probably never have found out Marguerite was a spy, or if she did, it would not have personally infected her if she had not traveled to Bolshevik Russia, Russia in search of adventure. Because both women left Germany by the summer of 1919, when the Treaty of Versailles was signed, they both went their separate ways. Marguerite goes back to America, um, Stan gets her divorce, she becomes a British citizen again. As I say, Marguerite, returns to the States, the war is over, but the story is far from over. Because Marguerite illegally enters Russia in January 1920, six months before Stan arrives. And Stan, desperate to go and see the new Russia firsthand, ignored all the warnings not to go. What you have to understand is after the war, um, the First World War, there was lots of stuff in the newspaper about Russia, lots of guessing what was going on there, even though um, there were a few journalists that could get information out, but that information was always vetted. So there was this fascination. There was a lot of people that actually wanted to go the experiment and things were not good in Britain or even in America. There were strikes. There was industrial upset. There was lots of things going on. So people were, some people were looking at Russia. Maybe this is the answer. Now, Marguerite herself in Russia knew the dangers, but she's in a very dangerous situation because the Bolsheviks knew uh, what Marguerite was up to when she arrived into Moscow. They knew from Berlin that she was a US military operative. So after a month of letting her roam the city, Marguerite was arrested as an American spy and she was interrogated, but she was released only if she agreed to report, report back to the Cheka on foreigners in Moscow. She was not permitted to leave Russia. Now Marguerite had no choice but to give information to her minders or else she would go back to Lubyanka and probably be shot as a spy. Now she needed to protect real spies and she knows that there are real spies in Moscow at that time. Um, two in particular, one was an Irishman called Francis McCullough um, and another one, Meron C. Cooper. You might know his name. He was the chap that made King Kong in 1933. He is an amazing guy, uh, got into all sorts of um, trouble and things, but he also was spying. And he was in prison at the time, but in a very nice prison. He wasn't being tortured or anything. 
and she was giving food to to him at one point anyway but then her naive roommate stan from berlin turns up she gets an invite why does she get an invite well the term used during the first world war is a full spy and Americans might know this as a patsy, but basically a full spy is a man or woman, either a convicted spy or more rarely a simpleton, who was deliberately engaged by an intelligence department in order that he or she might be caught by the enemy. Why? To protect their valuable spies. So another word for this is a patsy. Stan became Marguerite's patsy. Stan went because she thought she could write stories. She was given an invite. Um, that's her reason for going. Marguerite was there um, for different reasons, obviously. So Stan became Marguerite's patsies. Stan, on, immediately after her arrest, within 24 hours, she was sentenced to death and imprisoned for nearly six months until her release as part of the negotiations for the Anglo-Soviet Trade Treaty. Now, Stan really had a miserable time. I mean, she went on hunger strike four times. Her descriptions of what went on, hearing what went on, I think actually affected her mind for the rest of her life. Um, but anyway, for now. So much of her time in prison was in solitary confinement. And as I said, she never recovered physically or mentally from the experience, despite spending the following five years when she got back in December 2020 to England uh, to clear her name. Now, was Stan a British spy? This is the question. Marguerite always maintained that she was. She said that when they shared a room in Berlin, and this is key, Stan came across some carbon copy notes in the waste paper basket waste paper basket that Marguerite had tossed away. Now, only a spy would know what they meant. Marguerite also said that Stan discussed giving information to the British intelligence in Berlin and boasted that she was a spy. Now, both of these statements are problematic, but you can read those statements in um, Marguerite's memoirs. So why would a spy throw confidential notes in a hotel waste paper basket. That's the first thing, especially as they both were staying at the hotel called the Adlong, which still exists, because it was filled to brim with spies of every nationality um, and diplomats from all over the world. So, you know, there's no, there's just no way. Secondly, a spy who tells you that they are a spy is not a spy. Why on earth would they blow their own cover. Okay, so, the, so this is problematic. However, from the research I uncovered, it is clear that Stan not only was a complicated and emotionally damaged person, and people either loved or hated her in equal proportions, she also could manipulate people. She frequently boasted and exaggerated her own abilities. Her brother was a diplomat. Maybe she did fabricate, you know? Who knows? There is evidence she was bisexual, so she might have um, been trying to impress Marguerite by boasting that she was a spy. I found no evidence that Stan was on the payroll of any intelligence service, and I looked, um, but she probably offered information in Berlin for cash, and that was not uncommon. Marguerite probably knew this, and twisted the facts for her own uses. Um, Marguerite was a, a very accomplished and very, very clever woman and very poised. You need to read her memoirs of her early years to see how her personality was formed. And her personality was formed, she didn't get on with her mother. She had to learn from an early age to keep things from her mother. Um, she knew how to keep a secret. She knew how to switch off. Um, anyway, these are all very important things. So what we do know for sure, that between 1920 and 1925, Stan Harding was used as a pawn 
in the game Nations Play, and this is how. She was used by Marguerite to protect other spies. She was used by both Britain and Bolshevik Russia as a bargaining chip in the Anglo-Soviet Trade Treaty of 1921. She was released as that was being negotiated and that was part of the deal. She was one of the two people to get £3,000 compensation. She was used by the right wing in Britain who were anti-communist, anti-Bolshevik and supported Churchill's invasion of Mamanx supporting the white Russians. Britain owed America huge amounts of money after the First World War. And the Americans put pressure on Britain to ignore Stan's claims, especially as Marguerite's information was also shared with the British intelligence services. And that's, we know that now. And let's face it, Stan didn't have a hope in hell of getting either an apology or compensation out of the United States. And Britain was totally complicit in that. The Foreign Office described Stan as, quote unquote, the bane of their lives as she harassed five separate governments to clear her name. She was used by the left wing press in Britain who were anti-American and used her case to further their own battles. And finally, she was used by the idealist who genuinely believed that the principle of journalism should always be independent of any one or nation state. I think most journalists technically would agree with that, but whether it actually happens or not, who knows. So I'm going to conclude now. I think there are several important issues that Stan doggedly argued and highlighted by their very public spat. And this spat for five years was headlines all over the world, okay? And that 100 years later, which is what we are today, um, there are some things that are still relevant. And I'd like to leave you with some questions. For example, is it acceptable that a foreign correspondent like Marguerite also worked as a spy? Now, Stan publicly argued that this was wrong on all levels. She was supported by the National Union of Journalists and the Institute of Journalists in, in the UK. Stan was really angry that her rights as an individual were not taken into account. If we are unfairly imprisoned or accused of spying abroad, similar to Stan's case, can we expect to be protected by our governments? I mean, this was her question. She said, yes, we should be. I think the recent case of the PhD student, Matthew Hedges, I don't know if you remember that uh, pre-COVID, he was imprisoned in the UAE as a spy, shows that trade relations with that particular country at that time was more important than individual rights. And we can point to other people around the world that that's happening to right now. Therefore, if the state as a collective entity is more important than an individual, does this mean that we cannot expect when we travel um, to be under the protection of our country. So should Stan, or for that matter, any of us today, take more responsibility for our own safety when we're traveling? Stan's story doesn't end in 1925. When she gives up her fight to sue the United States of America, she does emigrate to India, quite a few years after she went originally. Now, I'm going to end there to see if you have any questions, but if you would like to learn any more about this incredibly interesting but flawed woman and discover the adventures she had, which continued, believe me, um, please do take a look at my book, The Lady is a Spy, which is the tangled lives of Stan Harding and Marguerite Harrison. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Thank you. So if I get out of that and stop share. Okay. Thank you for that, um, Melanie. That was brilliant. What an fascinating <laughs> woman. Um, does anybody have any questions? You can unmute um, if you want to ask them or um, type them in the chat if you'd prefer. Um, yeah. Um, if, if nobody's got one, I, I can ask one. I've got one question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, well, I've got two questions, actually, um, and a comment as well. Um, but I'm a bit surprised. Right at the start, you said that 
Um, Grace's family, that's Grace's the mother, yeah. the mother's family had uh, minted their own currency. Um, I'm wondering what you mean by that. Do you mean that the retail store issued their own tokens? Yes, yes, I did. Sorry, well, I didn't make not, that clear. That's not, that's not yeah. the same as minting your own currency normally. Well, I'm sorry, I used the wrong wording. Token. Um, the second thing is, how did Stan regain her British nationality after divorce? Because normally when you divorce, you retain your husband's nationality. Um, she came back to England she took the documents and she was supported. One of the people who supported her was, what's his name? Trench, the poet that lived in Florence, who also was instrumental in setting up the British Institute in Florence. And then there was another person who supported her on her application. And so she was given British nationality well, back again. Fair enough. Okay, that's great. Um, last a comment. Um, I think it's pretty common that journalists quite often um, act as spies or informal um, informants to their own governments. Um, and it's not just, not, not just journalists, I mean, everybody. I mean, when I was working in, when I was working in Germany and um, I went over into East Germany for something, I, I got interrogated in great detail when I came back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not. I, it is very, very um, common, definitely. Um, but the question that I was throwing to you, you know, is it morally right? Because the whole of Stan's argument, part of her fight um, was not just against the American government, but was against the journalistic institutions that hired um, Marguerite, because she was saying, this is wrong. She had a lot of backing to support her on that. Now, we know that reality, of course, there's going to be um, journalists who are spies and, you know, businessmen who are spies or whatever. But my question was, is this morally right? Because I was I was coming from Stan's point of view. I see. Right. Yes. OK, thank you. There's a message from Heather in the chat that says, fascinating talk, thank you. I've just brought your book and look forward very much to reading it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Well, I, I wanted to know, um, Melanie, about um, Stan's relationship with her parents and her brother after this sort of massive, sort of massive incidents, really, not just one incident, series of adventures. What, what was that like? Did, did they have a relationship? Yes, the mother, she seemed to keep in contact with the mother. The mother died, um, when was it? I, don't, I can't remember exactly, maybe early 20s. She died in a Plymouth Brethren care home in Clevedon in Bristol. The father died during, I think it was the First World War, and I don't know what he died of. I couldn't find off, but he died. Their, their relationship was always fraught. OK, mm -hmm. always fraught. Now, with her brother, they lost their closeness. Um, you have to read her exploits in China. Um, but he also was a completely bonkers person. Um, there's one report I read of him. Um, he would have um, interview people who would come into the office as a consular and he would refuse to wear trousers because it was too hot. He would have dinner parties and at 10 o'clock a bell would go and he would just walk out of the room. You know, he's total eccentric. So she was an eccentric as well. He did actually get married, the brother, um, and married the daughter of a missionary. Um, so he's also an interesting character, but they, they fell out. And I think they fell out from the trip to China. Oh. So, and she doesn't mention anything about going back to Canada after um, Florence. I mean, she went back a few times when they were living in Clevedon, when they were living in Europe, she went with her mother by boat. She spent one summer with her cousins and things, but she never mentions it after that. So I, I don't think oh, she did. Interesting. So there's a, if anybody's interested, there's a fantastic little museum, just like, like the Porridge Museum, in a place called Dundas in Canada, in Ontario. Now, this museum is where I got a lot of the information from Stan's family. 
because Dundas was one of the places where they set up the stores um, and they've got um, archives of the stuff. And they've also got quite a lot of the research that I've done because I just felt they needed that because of the family. So do have a look at them online. And if you're interested, I think you might be able to access their stuff. Oh, Dundas, wow. Dundas in Ontario, Canada. Got another comment in the chat from Jane. This has been fascinating. Thank you. It strikes me that this would be a great subject for a film. A fascinating woman with an equally interesting family. <laughs> and I agree totally. I'm just waiting for the... Uh, <laughs> um, can, I, can I just say that Marguerite Harrison is not unknown in America? OK, she um, um, was was a journalist, as you know, she wrote memoir, memoirs, she did lots of talks. Um, and when I did my research initially, her name kept coming up everywhere, but Stans didn't. Mm. So she hasn't been forgotten by history. And I think part of my reasoning for sticking with the project was that, you know, you cannot have Marguerite's story without Stans. I mean, Marguerite went on to do other things after that. Um, she did a, an amazing documentary um, with um, set in, a, in a Iran with um, um, a tribe. And it was, I think that, that she was working on looking at the oil uh, because we had, the Brits had had a deal with the Bakari tribe to get the oil in 1909. And at that time, before that, um, the Americans were desperately trying to get more oil, even though they had oil in their own country. And I think that she was basically as a spy, you know, trying to go out and suss that. So there's a whole story there. Um, but but she has been investigated and there's stuff out there about her. Um, so. Could I ask a question? What What do you think is... Well, what elements do you think contribute to her being kind of forgotten or put into the background? And I use that phrase quite deliberately. Really. OK, OK. I don't think it's anything sinister, like we're going to shove her away. I think there are so many things in our history that we forget. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, um, we, we talk about the Jarrow March and all the people coming over, you know, walking to London. There were about six or seven Jarrow marches, you know? Um, and what was the other one? The Darien Projects, a classic one of um, sc the Scots before uh, they joined the UK, they went out to set uh, their own colony and they went bankrupt. Now, maybe in, in Scottish history, you remember that, but in our history, we don't really remember that very much. So there are a lot of things that are forgotten in history and you kind of think, well, you know why and I just think that she she was one of them and then the second world war came along and then second world war female spies mm. became much more popular mm. you know and she was complicated she caused a lot of problems mm. um you know she was an embarrassment to a lot of people she's an embarrassment to the foreign office she was an embarrassment um mm. to prime ministers um you know so there could have been an element of that but I, I I just don't think she was deliberately forgotten I think we forget people quickly yeah I think uh, yeah I appreciate that and I because I suppose I was just thinking about like you say the second world war female spies but also then more lastly the cold war spies you know you Kim yeah. Philby's and things like yeah. that but of course yeah. that are much more within a certain kind of memory and there's often yeah. films made about that time as well so yeah. again, some of those are kind of like their exactly. legend, if you like, is maintained and they still have relatives yeah. and, and people around now. So, um, But who do we think of as the First World War female spy? We think of Matahari. Yeah. You know, everybody knows Matahari. And why? Because she was exotic. She made herself up. Mm. You know, um, she had a, an incredible life and then she dies a, you know, a hero kind of thing, you know. Um, but Stan wasn't a hero. She dies a horrible death. You know, she's in India and I won't tell you how you die. So you can buy the book. But, you know, <laughs> it's um, it's not a nice death. And she gets Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, so, you know, and Marguerite is, as I say, still remembered. I mean, she was a Baltimore socialite before she got into all of this. And she knew very important. Yes. 
Sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you for listening. Uh, Any other questions? Last question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, yes. Were you able to look at um, consular papers relating to her time in China, or indeed what the Chinese government thought of her? Uh, well, first of all, um, no. Um, I didn't. I mean, that could be someone else's research project, and I'm happy to pass what I've got. Um, I did find um, a consular book about consular staff, and that's how I got the information, much of the information about her brother, um, for example. Now, I did go to Kew, obviously, to the National Archives to look at to see if I could find any information that she was actually working as a spy for the British government. And at one stage, I, I actually asked an expert who knows those archives brilliantly, because I don't know if anyone knows them, but anything before a certain date, certainly all the First World War stuff is not digitalized. So you have to go and you've got to literally cross reference, or you did when I was doing the research with little, little cards. Um, so I didn't find any any evidence. I'm sorry, but if that's a project someone wants, I'm happy to um, give you what I've got. <laughs> there was um, a question in the chat from Ali. She said, "How long did Stan live in India?" It would be good to think that she had a better time there after her incarceration in Russia. And then she said, "I think you pretty much answered my question. Thank you. What a huge amount of research. <laughs> Thank you. She 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 was free." Um, but I think her mind was damaged by everything that happened. She also, in 1933, I think it was, or 34, 35, I can't remember the exact dates, but she gets in another battle with Marguerite because Marguerite publishes one of her memoirs and in it again says that Stan um, is, a, is a British spy. So she takes her to court, she's got other people backing her uh, to do this, and it's another few years of, uh, you know, affecting her mental health. Um, you can't battle against someone like Marguerite with all her connections, you just, you know, you can't do it. And she wasn't, didn't have the personality, Stan, to be able to stand back and say, I'm done with that, this is what's happened. Yes, she was a spy, because we all know that now, I mean, even even Marguerite admitted it, you know, um, and you go to the archives in um, Maryland and you all, all the information's there, you know, it's all open to the public. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Any other questions? I think, we're, I think we're well that was an absolutely fascinating talk Melanie thank you so much um for sort of shining a light on a incredible life um and it's definitely one of those people who needs to be kind of rescued from the footnotes of history and I think you've done that brilliantly oh um, I hope so and if you know any film producers just let me know <laughs> will do um so thank you everyone for attending and um i know there was a couple of people who popped in and out and maybe had a couple of technical difficulties so don't worry we will be posting uh the recording of this talk on youtube so you can watch it again at your leisure um and thank you so much for attending and have a lovely rest of your evening thank you thank you everybody. Bye. Bye. bye thank you bye thank you Right, bye-bye then. Thank yeah. you. Have a lovely evening. Thank you.